This is Ryan Newton. Oh, what a guest. <laughs> and um, uh, Ryan student Oma is, a, is um, one of our interns this uh, summer working with us, so he was introduced a few days ago. Um, so Ryan, you're, you're just here to kind of be this weekend, but not tomorrow, because you're going to be at the computer lab. Yes, I'll be here in the morning, though, if anyone wants to catch me tomorrow, okay. and the rest of this afternoon. Yeah. Great. Okay. No holds bar. Ask questions during the talk. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, please. So this is a talk about the work we've been doing over the last few years on statically checked deterministic parallel programming. Uh, so the motivation for me starts with the broader topic of reproducibility. This is why I care about determinism. So reproducibility is important in many aspects of computing. I found that if you search GitHub for can't reproduce, there are at least 43,000 hits, which are presumably from bug reports that people cannot reproduce. So reproducibility in software engineering is important. Uh, it's also, this is also reflected in the fact that the Debian project has invested some significant effort in getting bitwise reproducible builds. But unfortunately, this is a sort of package by package trench warfare. And they've, in spite of investing effort, only gotten to about 86% of packages that are bitwise reproducible. So it seems a bit unfortunate that there isn't some underlying abstraction that ensures that this number is always 100% rather than a package by package slog. One final example of where reproducibility is important is, of course, in science itself, in the computational sciences. So in the context, context of computational science, you would expect that a scientist would be able to, in the, someday in the future, may be able to come across a plot, either produced by some cloud software they're using or on somebody else's blog, and perhaps with one click be able to download the program that corresponds to that plot and reproduce it locally. So that's the world I would like to live in. And of course, this means that the, the cloud, in this case, has to be able to cough up the program P, which actually produces that plot, given some input data. So for these kinds of batch processing jobs, the input data in the sciences would typically be some scientific data set that would be archived in some long-term storage. But there's still the matter of controlling the execution of P so that we get exactly the same pixels in the plot that comes out in the end. And then the scientists can have a controlled reproduction of this computational experiment so that they then can modify it to experiment further. Now, controlling the execution of this P really has two pieces to it. We have to control the environment, and we have to control the execution. And that execution can be controlled using dynamic means or using static programming language features. So first, about the environment bit. Uh, our tools for this have recently gotten quite a lot better. So they're not perfect, but we can achieve something like a deterministic base image using Docker or NixOS to say, here's the system image that I expect this program to run in, and describe it in a declarative way, in a precise way. But what about the execution? So the dynamic approach is to put P in a sandbox. And there are a number of packages out there that so-called deterministic multi-threading systems, like Kendo or dthreads, which will control the execution of these threads at runtime. So P can, in this case, be an arbitrary x86 program, let's say. And Kendo or dthreads can control the interleaving of all the racy activities on these threads. Uh, so that gives you a form of determinism. Uh, there's, this field is kind of nascent, and there are not very good top-to-bottom software solutions for this right now. Uh, there are some modified operating systems that support this, uh, but it's, it's still in its beginnings. And furthermore, even the best results in this area require a 2 to 4x slowdown in the execution of the program in order to achieve determinism. But there's, aside from performance, there's actually another problem with dynamic enforcement that I want to point to as a motivation for static enforcement. So if you think about it, because the deterministic threading packages uh, enforce deterministic thread scheduling, the, thread, the number of threads becomes an, uh, a, an input to the semantics of that <coughs> So this program P is now a function from inputs and number of threads to outputs. So you can reproduce it on your machine as long as you run it with the same number of threads that I used on my machine. If you're, uh, it is, but it would be nice if we could change certain aspects of the environment, like how many threads we run on. So we could run it on a 72-core server or 4-core laptop uh, portably and get the same answer in both cases. So I would say that this is a detriment to portability. Um, and that's really just an efficiency thing. I suppose you could pick, pick some maximum number of threads, but then your laptop might run out of memory trying to run this on 128 threads, for instance. And you know, this, of course, other architectural features slip in as well. You might have the GPU model, the processor model, the OS version. There are lots of things that can slip in here as, uh, as non-portable inputs to your program. Uh, and in the most extreme case, of course, the scheduler trace itself, this is what we would call non-determinism, 
when you depend on the exact schedule that the OS uses for scheduling threads. But even then, you can still achieve re reproducibility. If reproducibility is your only goal, uh, you can use a tool like Mozilla RR or Pinplay from Intel to record the exact series of system calls and then replay that exact execution. But a trace of system calls is not exactly a very human accessible form of a program for you to download and use. OK, so the hope would be to instead use static checking. And this is not a new idea, of course. Uh, fully 45 years ago, there was this elegant quote about this very topic. It is therefore very important that a high-level language designed for parallel programming should provide complete security against time-dependent errors by means of a compile time check. Uh, so I, I love this because it provides motivation for our current work. And I think this is a great dream. And uh, this was the quote I was wondering if you'd want to disavow now. But it seems that we haven't achieved this goal yet. We, we've done a shabby job of, of implementing this dream. Uh, and why is that? Well, the reason I would point to is that, of course, the lion's share of languages that we use have shared mutable state as part of their, uh, as part of their programming model. And uh, while we do have an intellectual foundation for achieving determinism in spite of this, we can use ownership types, permission types, fractional permissions. Uh, we've got a lot of work over the last 15 years on separation logic. So we understand how to use one of these framing rules to build the type system of a programming language, such as deterministic parallel Java, which was a project from Illinois, also concurrent revisions at Microsoft Redmond. Uh, deterministic parallel Java has a type system that directly incorporates a notion of region types and a disjointness relation between regions. And in the type system, it can conclude that writes to one region of the heap are, uh, are non-interfering with writes to another region of the heap if the two regions are disjoint. So this is all great, but this idea doesn't seem to have achieved great uptake yet either. And part of the problem may be that this has a rather high annotation burden, uh, not to mention the fact that it requires strapping a totally new type system on top of the existing Java language, uh, which has its own adoption hurdles. So the main subject of the talk today is to take a different approach. So not to start with a language with shared mutable state, but instead start with a language where there is no shared mutable state and try to add back some of these structured, safe side effects that we can use for high performance parallel programming, but which we can design by construction so as to retain determinism. And that's the main idea of this talk. So uh, what do we pick as a starting point for a language with, shared, uh, with no shared mutable state? Well, there are really two ideas that, uh, that I'm familiar with in this area. And one of them is to use a data flow or message passing type language. And the other is to start with a functional language or a functional subset of an existing language. Uh, so, I've worked on both of these ideas. I did my thesis uh, on the first one, working on a stream processing language that was called WaveScope. And WaveScope, it was a, it was a standalone, a new domain-specific language. And so the work on it sort of spanned the stack from runtime to applications. And um, we did a lot of work uh, on the compiler, which was a two-stage heterogeneous metaprogramming uh, compiler. And uh, also on the runtime, which executed on embedded devices in the network, such as this custom platform that we built for acoustic localization of animals. Uh, some of these platforms had no operating system, and so there was lots of fun with uh, compiling for embedded platforms there. Uh, so we also did a number of applications with this kind of stream processing language uh, with no shared state between the actors. Uh, we did pothole detection uh, in a fleet of taxi cabs around the Boston area. We also did some work on background subtraction and images with tracking, again, with tracking animals in the wild. Uh, that's a marmot, by the way, in Colorado. That's what we tracked with our acoustic platform. All right, so uh, I also heard from Suresh Jagannathan that they had run WaveScript on, uh, on a test fleet they have at Purdue of wind turbines. Okay, so I, I believe, strongly believe that this idea works, works rather well, that we should have more support for data flow languages, and of course, uh, data flow graphs of data transforming operations with no shared state is also the basis of a number of very popular data parallel frameworks recently. Whether it's fine grain for vectorized programming, coarse grain for data center level parallelism like Flume Java, or something in between like the new TensorFlow system. Also, these ideas are very applicable to GPU programming. So graphs, data flow graphs of uh, data transformations. And we ourselves have done some work in this area uh, which I'm only going to briefly cite now because I want to move on. The main system we've worked on in the GPU space is the Accelerate language, which is an embedded domain-specific language inside Haskell. And it's getting some usage out in the world. There's a startup company called Flowbox that uses Accelerate as its main means of programming GPUs. 
OK, so with that out of the way, I wanted to spend most of the talk talking about this second idea. So data flow and message passing are great, but there are some reasons that we have to going towards more general purpose programs, programs with arbitrary functions or task parallelism. So if we start with functional parallelism as our baseline and we want to add a structured set of effects, how can we do it? Well, first of all, what do we mean by function parallelism? Well, this, of course, refers to just the fact that in a functional program, any two sub-expressions can be executed in parallel. So you could visualize the evolving functional program as a tree of potentially parallel function calls. Now, of course, as with most modern parallel languages, we use compiler hints to say where the parallelism should go uh, in the Haskell implementation. But this is no different, really, from other parallel languages, such as Silk Plus, uh, which have a mechanism for parallel function calls. But in the context of a purely functional language, there's a significant performance opportunity cost when it comes to writing this kind of parallel program. That is to say that you can't have any crosstalk between threads. So any performance opportunity that depends on modification to shared memory, uh, you can't leverage that opportunity. You likewise uh, lose the ability to do in-place update of data structure between threads. Within a single thread, functional programmers have known how to do this. Simon and others were doing this at least as early as the early 90s. There's something called the STMonad, which enables you to do in-place single-threaded computation. So you could do, for example, a sequential in-place sort using the STMonad. But you can't expand the STMonad to cross parallel leaves of this computation, because that would introduce, immediately introduce data races and non-determinism, and you wouldn't be able to use this in the functional portion of your program. So that's disallowed. So our basic idea in the series of work that I'm going to tell you about today is that we reintroduce a new monadic uh, leaf here, uh, which we call the par monad. So one of these par sessions is much like an ST session. It's a dischargeable effect in the same sense that ST is a dischargeable effect, except it also has a built-in notion of forking parallel computations. Now, what can these parallel computations do to communicate with one another? Well, they can communicate through channels. We know that that retains determinism from Kahn's 1974 proof that Kahn process networks are deterministic. We can also communicate through IVARs or single assignment variables. There's also a pretty long tradition of single assignment languages going, I think, back to uh, Tesla in 1958. We've also, uh, you can read about our extension to program with IVARs in Haskell. Uh, Simon had a paper with us in 2011, and Simon Marlow has described this in his book on parallel programming in Haskell. In the last few years, we've taken this a little bit further, and we've introduced a new kind of shared variable that we call LVARs for lattice variables. And the general idea of an LVAR is that it captures some monotonically changing uh, shared state. So this would be things like sets that grow in size but don't shrink, with insert but not delete, counters that only grow but never decrease, anything that can be defined as occupying some state space that forms a lattice, a semi-join lattice specifically. Uh, so we typically implement these kinds of data structures, especially sets and maps, using lock-free concurrent data structures. Because, of course, they are shared between threads, and we need to operate, perform insert operations on different threads accessing the same data. So these lock-free concurrent data structures evolve with um, commuting writes uh, during one of these parallel regions. But then at the end of the parallel region, there's an implicit barrier. Uh, and after that point, these data structures are frozen and appear just like any other purely functional data structure to the functional program that's using the par monad. All right, so we've currently implemented this in Haskell. You could just as well start with any other purely functional language or compiler-enforced pure subset. Uh, for example, the C version of C-sharp in Midori is pretty close to what you need for this. Um, here's what it looks like in the Haskell library. You can do a monadic computation, which um, creates a new LVAR of some type, like a set. And then you can fork child computations within which you can read and mutate that variable uh, concurrently with the parent thread, which is also reading and mutating the same variable. And the essential game that we play is to design the set of operations over these variables so that this can never result in non-determinism. And thus, when we exit this run par session, when the monad returns and we return a value, whatever value we achieve is as though it were computed by a purely functional computation. So we've got kind of purely functional semantics, but, uh, but some imperative mechanisms. OK, so that's what we refer to as the par session, which matches the little shape in our visualization. To take a more concrete example, here's a shopping cart. So if we create a new map, LVAR, uh, we can asynchronously use one thread to insert that there's one pair of shoes, and on another thread, insert that there are two books in the cart. And of course, these two inserts commute, so the end result of this computation is deterministic. And in fact, if we, as the last thing in this computation, get the number of shoes, we don't even need to wait for the books to be written 
to return this. This computation can return as soon as the shoes are available because you know that that part of the state doesn't depend on the book part of the state. So what is the actual lattice that goes with it? This, it looks like uh, the following. Um, so the least upper bound operation in this lattice is the merger of two finite maps. And when we always start, start off at the bottom state, that's the initial state for our variable. The top state by convention means error, uh, and we use it as a runtime exception. Uh, now, depending on which we evaluate first, if we insert the shoes first, we're going to go to that state before moving up to our final state there. But we could have very well followed the other path. So the book might have gotten inserted first, and then the shoes, which would have left us there. So clearly, we end up at the same state at the end of the computation. And how do we define this operation that reads out the number of books without worrying about the number of shoes? Well, the semantics of this is a little bit interesting, because you need to define what we call a threshold set, this bit that's in the dashed box. And this threshold set is any subset of elements in the lattice that are pairwise incompatible. So their least upper bound, the least upper bound of everything in that set must be top. Um, so uh, once you've established that, you know that you can return from this get operation whenever you are at any state in that threshold set or any state above it. Because if you're in a state above it, such as the yellow arrow here, you can basically figure out which one of the threshold, set, threshold elements you're above, and that tells you what you should return. So this is how our blocking reads work. Now, there are a few problems with this basic form of the mechanism. So you can't see the exact contents of the cart, which can be quite frustrating. You can't iterate over the items in the cart. You can't determine if an item is not in the cart, so that is asking a negative question. And you can't react to writes you weren't expecting. This simple uh, insert and get interface is very limited. So those are all issues that we addressed in uh, some of our recent work extending this basic model, where we add a notion of handlers, quiescence, and freezing that I'll tell you about in the next few slides. So a freezing is just what people would normally call a read on a mutable variable. It's an exact non-blocking read. So it gives you the current state of the variable at that exact point in time, uh, which under normal conditions is a non-deterministic operation because the thing may be still in flux and changing. Uh, but the key here is that freezing is a destructive read where you actually mark the state of the LVAR as frozen, and any subsequent attempts to write to a frozen LVAR uh, cause a write after freeze exception. So basically, when you freeze, you get the exact value. And if the value was too early, if there was still a write coming, then you throw an exception. So a whole program that's written with this mechanism, with this fine-grained freezing mechanism that allows you to freeze individual LVARs, it basically has two possible outcomes. When you run that program, you either get a unique final, final answer or you get an exception. So this is a property that we call quasi-determinism because you can never get the wrong answer. You either get the unique answer or you get an exception. Wait, and so in your LVAR thing, if you're in your little run, run par mm -hmm. thing, so are you going to return the value even before all its thirds are finished? I mean, maybe some of them are later going to write into the LVAR. Or do you wait till they're all done? You typically need to wait until they're all done. OK. You need to flush out. You could leak out and be used. Right. There's no I.O. can occur inside these parallel things. So Correct. can't launch the missiles. Uh, well, our goal is not to only treat deterministic programming, but just to track the determinism level. So you can launch the missiles, but then you can't run par in pure code. You have to use run par I.O., which you can only run in I.O. code. A quasi-determinism, yeah, yeah. you have to run it in I.O. Oh, dear, exception. That would be bad. Mm. Right. You can't be cool then. Uh, yes, that would be sort of the full non-deterministic mode where you can launch missiles. In this quasi-deterministic mode, you yeah. can use freeze, yeah. but not launch missiles. Okay. And you still are forced to stay in the I.O. monad, because this is a form of non-determinism, this quasi-determinism. So the run part that gives you back just the value that can be used in pure code uh, doesn't let you use this freeze. Oh. Um, but I argue that this is still an interesting point in the space. Because there are certain ways that quasi-determinism is a little bit different than determinism. In particular, it can support recovery strategies. So you could basically have ways of retrying and controlling the schedule to try again if you get a freeze after put exception. Or a put after freeze exception, I mean. But how can you try again? Because it's frozen now. Can you unfreeze or something? Oh, you can rerun the whole computation if you like. Because the computation is deterministic and you know what the starting point was. So yes, that particular LVAR on that execution is frozen. Uh, and we, we haven't implemented any, any fine-grained way to roll back. But, uh, but you can retry the whole thing. All right, so anyway, this is just an interesting point in the space between uh, determinism and non-determinism. So we've got determinism, we've got quasi-determinism, and then we've got data race freedom, 
which is weaker, and then fully unsafe code. And our goal is to provide a suite of mechanisms and a type system that allows you to track exactly where you are in this space and limits what you do accordingly. OK, so we've seen some examples of these least upper bound writes that move you up in the lattice. Uh, we've seen blocking threshold reads, like getting the number of shoes. Uh, we haven't yet seen an example of the handler's quiescence and quiescence that I mentioned, although we saw an example of freeze. So here's, a, here's an example for handlers and quiescence. What if we want to do a breadth first search on a graph, and we want to accumulate the nodes that we've seen in a set LVAR? So from some starting point, to do a BFS, we can insert every, everything that we come to into our set LVAR, and then recursively insert all our neighbors in parallel. Uh, so that works fine, and the set LVAR can accumulate. Some of these inserts will be uh, redundant because you'll insert neighbors that are already present in the set. So one issue here is uh, how do you implement this when you can't look at the contents of the set LVAR? Uh, other concurrent data structures might allow you to check to see what's in the set, uh, check to see if a neighbor is already in the set, the scene set. But with LVARs, you can't do that because that primitive mechanism of checking whether something's absent enables non-determinism. So how do you write this in a statically deterministic way? Uh, well, the way that we do it is we uh, enable a new notion of um, ev an event is an update which actually changes the state of an LVAR as distinct from an ins redundant insert of something that's already there, which does not cause an event. And we say that event handlers listen for these events and launch callbacks when they occur. So the interesting thing is that this still retains determinism because you don't know who will insert seven and you don't know when they'll insert seven. But, uh, and you don't know if you're the first or the second person to insert seven, but as long as you call the handler at least once on seven, you can keep the whole result deterministic. And then finally, we need a, a way to tell when all of this is done. So what does it look like in code? Well, we create a scene set to track the nodes that we visited. Uh, we attach a handler to the scene set, and we say for every new node, for every new element that appears in the set, simply take its neighbors and add them back into the set by calling the insert operation here. Right here. Uh, so then we kick it all off by just inserting the start node. And inserting that one node will cause this handler to be called again and again until it reaches a fixed point. And we detect that by a quies operation, which basically says, when no more uh, copies of this handler are running, return. And after that point, it's safe to call freeze. So this pattern of quiescing and then freezing is safe. Uh, this is a quasi-deterministic program I've showed you because it uses the freeze operation. Uh, but we could also achieve the same effect by just wrapping it in a run par and depending on that final global barrier to be the sort of freeze of last resort, Wait, if you will. Oh, not at all. Because uh, each time you try, the only way you can go around a loop is by inserting a node that's already in the set, oh. which does not cause the callback to fire. Why not? Uh, say that, yeah. Well, yes, uh, events are updates that change the LVAR state. Uh, inserting something that's already there does not change the LVAR state, therefore no handler is fired. Um, so that's the, that's the idea. And so this particular suite of mechanisms allows you to stay deterministic, uh, handlers and uh, this definition of events. And we depend on it quite heavily for all of our data structure so processes. This is LVAR set thing. That's a deep, 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 deep LVARs are one thing, but <coughs> LVARs containing sets of mm -hmm. other things mm -hmm. is also deeply built in with some magical callbacks and quiescence primitives. Well, every data structure that we implement has uh, its own implementation of callbacks. So there's a lot of, when we implement a particular concurrent data structure, like when we have a C try or a concurrent skip list, we've got some very data structure specific mechanisms for implementing these, this API. Uh, so that is certainly true. And in terms of it being magic or not, well, the implementation of these data structures are trusted. I'll get back to this in a little while. Okay, so the implementation is not, does not have no guarantees about determinism or quiescence or anything. Correct. It just has to be, you know, you just have to know what you're doing. For the lock-free data structures, yes. We do have a way to implement uh, a special class of LVARs, which are these pure LVARs that are simply a box containing a pure data structure. And we can give quite a few more assurances there. But when you drop down to the level of implementing a lock-free data structure, like a concurrent skip list, well, verifying that is, is a much bigger enterprise. And I'll get back to that at the very end. Okay, so now I have told you a little bit about the LVAR abstraction. And in the second half of the talk, I want to zoom in a little bit more on uh, the performance, the applications, ex some more extensions to that basic abstraction that I've already shown you, and then some implementation techniques. So how do we implement these data structures efficiently? I mentioned lock-free implementations. Uh, and also, how do we um, 
operate in a parallel context where we're also computing, uh, communicating over the network and needing to serialize these LVARs. OK, so uh, first of all, what kind of code actually gets faster when we use LVARs? The kinds of things we've been targeting are purely functional programs that have performance problems that are um, keeping them from, scale, from parallel scaling. So uh, we took a KCFA implementation, a control flow analysis from Matthew Mike. And the core of the algorithm is essentially this, um, this search over this the graph of abstract states. So at each point in time, what we do is we take the current set of abstract states we've explored, and we expand each one to include the neighbors, and then we set union all of those back together. So the original functional program that we started with spends quite a lot of its time constructing all these data structures only to union them back together. Um, now, unfortunately, none of the fusion frameworks I'm familiar with, of which the functional programming community has developed many, uh, are very useful for this kind of scenario where you're doing operations on nested collections. So uh, fold of a union over a set of sets, for example. And I'd love to hear otherwise if that's the case. So we couldn't think of a good way to parallelize this or to speed it up using the purely functional program. But if you're willing to have some effects, you can use the Elvar formulation, uh, in which you just have a much more imperative program, and you deforest all those intermediate states. Instead, you just create a single accumulator Elvar, and you do a parallel for loop, which is implemented with those handlers, by the way. You do a parallel for loop, iterating over the, all the states, and then iterating over all the neighbors of all the states, and insert each one of those into the final accumulator. So you've effectively deforested all these intermediate sets that you were creating only to union back together. Uh, so that gives us a big speed up just from the deforestation. And then it also gets the parallelism, uh, the limiting factors that were keeping us from achieving effective parallelism out of the way, namely, uh, the program on the top was spending all of its time futzing with these data structures in a way that was fine-grained and not very parallelizable. The program on the bottom gets a reasonable 8x parallel speedup on a small, typical workstation machine. All right, so that's, um, that's sort of a combined benefit of, around, of 200x. Uh, ooh, gosh, this was a couple years ago, and I'm trying to remember. So this was not close to linear speedup. I think it was a 12 or 16 core machine, and we were only getting 8x speedup. There's not a transitive closure business here going on, isn't there? Um, We're iterating over the states, but which states initially? Right. So this would be one step. This would be one step of the algorithm. Oh, 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 oh. So this doesn't have the automatic, and then when you add them, then you no. So then you call back all that quiescence nonsense. That, that's, right. That this is is not part of that game. Right. That's not going on here. This is just a reduce of a map. I see. Yeah. And if you know a way to fuse that, I'd I'd love to uh, see it. Like fold build or what have you, or stream fusion. Um, yeah, but in any case, this is one way to fuse it or to deforest it. Uh, okay, so one more example application from the programming languages domain: uh, type checking. So all of these languages have um, the bottom one is Racket. Uh, have <laughs> recently acquired quite a number of uh, static type checkers or gradually typed type systems, uh, and there's a common feature of all the languages that are on the slide which is that all of them have a slowdown in type checking because they have very large union types combined with subtyping. And so Racket, for example, the type of, of uh, the plus operation, lowly plus operation, actually has hundreds of different cases in a sum. So as soon as you ask a question of, is A a subtype of B, you can have to check up to 100,000 combinations of two of these types. And as you can imagine, this makes things quite slow. There are files in the Racket repository that take five minutes to type check. And this is a significant source of frustration. Uh, so we don't make this asymptotically faster, but what we do is ask if we can improve the constant factors by uh, parallelizing and deforesting where possible. And our recent paper from this year does exactly that. We show how you can take the original type checker in typed racket and implement it so that the streams of possible solutions are deforested and instead are using a sort of CPS style with these callbacks to push possible solutions down a chain without any allocation. Uh, we also introduced this concept of saturating LVARs. So under certain circumstances, we can use LVARs to represent a type variable under unification, which, after all, occupies a lattice. And uh, if we're exploring multiple possible substitutions, some of them won't work. So we define a simple convention that doesn't modify the theory, where if you have a notion that an uh, LVAR can achieve too much information and be broken, uh, where it's basically a combination that won't work, then you can immediately free it and reclaim memory. And this is what we call a saturating LVAR. We say that it moves to a saturating state if it's achieved too much information, too many constraints, and has a contradiction in it. 
And so uh, in that paper, we managed to speed up the type checking algorithm in typed racket by a reasonable amount. And we also achieved that uh, deforestation benefit again, although this, in this case, not for the map data structure, but instead for these streams of solutions. OK, so um, one thing that we have to think carefully about when we move into this space of exploring search spaces using LVARs is that there are really uh, quite a few different relationships that the parent and the child computation can have. The one that I've showed you so far is the scenario where we have pure code, uh, purely functional code that issues a run par to run a monadic effect and then discharge that effect. So that's a scenario where the parent is basically the pure computation, the child is this monadic par computation. But of course, also, wherever we invoke a parallel call within an already parallel region with the async uh, combinator that I showed you, this also has a parent-child relationship. And it can be a, quite an interesting parent-child relationship. In this scenario where we're searching for a valid, um, basically a combination that type checks out of these tens of thousands of possibilities, uh, we might want to have the notion of a cancelable computation. So this is a parallel computation which you might at some point decide that you don't need. For example, if you're computing a parallel AND over two computations, as soon as one of them returns false, you can cancel the other one. So what are the semantic requirements on what you can do within that block if you want to have the ability to cancel it? So this is exactly the kind of thing we reflect in our type system so that we can establish a set of ground rules about what effects you can do where if you want to have a given capability like canceling a future or like doing deadlock detection in a future. As Simon mentioned before with, uh, with cycles in a graph, there are some scenarios where the easiest way to write a graph algorithm is simply to run a child computation that deadlocks under certain conditions and then simply detect that deadlock. And we have a monad transformer that does that. In fact, we wrote a paper about how these different effects combine together, the memory effects on the one hand and the control effects on the other hand. And what we do is for the memory effects, they give you a coarse grain approximation of what kinds of things your monadic computation will do. We introduce this E parameter to our monad. So we have par E A, where A is the return value, and E is a little type level product of different Booleans that tell you, uh, that implement these switches. They're, they've got five switches in the current implementation that say basically, do you do any least upper bound write operations? If you do, that switch is set on. Do you do any block and get operations? If you do, that switch is set on. Uh, and normally, most code you write is polymorphic over these switches. It doesn't care. But under certain situations, you need to restrict them. So in terms of these determinism levels that I mentioned, deterministic, non-deterministic, quasi-deterministic, if you tell me that you want to do cancellation, you have to add a monad transformer. This is one of our control effects over on the right. You add the monad transformer, but you also tell me that you want it to be deterministic. If you want to do cancellation, but you don't care about non-determinism, fine. You can have that choice. But if you want determinism, then there's a particular set of constraints on these switches. In particular, it has to be a read-only computation. So the write switch is turned off, and the bump switch is turned off. Uh, bump is a special form of write that's non-item potent. It's not least upper bound. Increasing a counter is the canonical example. OK, so that's one example of an interaction between these control effects and the memory effects. Uh, one of the things that's fun, uh, that was fun about this work was just identifying interesting combinations of control effects and memory effects, especially because these aren't the kind of usual effects that we think about all the time, like exceptions in state, but they're rather more esoteric and specific to parallel programming. Uh, so let me, let me show you some of those combinations that I think are interesting. So here's our parent and our child computation once again. Uh, the parent's the caller spawning a parallel child computation. Uh, so let's say we want it to be a cancelable future. So we better be running in that cancel T uh, monad transformer. Um, but we also have some extra observations that we can make here. Uh, I mentioned memoization on the right here as one of the control effects. So memoization means creating tables, uh, which are simply memo tables for pure functions. Now, one of the interesting things about memo tables is that um, they're stateful in the sense that they accumulate results, which can speed up future computations. But that's, that uh, statefulness is effectively invisible to all clients, right, if you isolate exceptions. Uh, so you can have a cancelable computation, which is read only, but which actually updates a memo table. And this is a trick that we use in the type checking scenario, because you can actually do useful unification work, and it can be stored in the memo table, even though you're cancelable, and even though you want to retain determinism. So that was a fun combo that we found. Also, those saturating LVARs I mentioned, those are the ones that can get too much information and break. Well, there's a funny property that if the, if the type of your subcomputation enforces that the only effect your child computation has is to write to a saturatable LVAR, well, then if the LVAR in fact saturates, 
you can have no future useful effect that's visible in the outside world. Because the one thing you were outputting to has now gotten into a broken state. And so then you can be canceled immediately. Uh, so this is another one of those combos. If you write to only a single variable, variable saturates, you can be canceled. Um, deadlock is a little bit of an interesting one. Because uh, it's one of the few uh, scenarios where we're not allowed to do read operations from the child computation. If your goal is to detect deadlock operations, then doing a read within the child on any pre-existing state from the parent, uh, it would be hard, impossible to distinguish temporarily blocking on some parent state via blocking read versus true deadlock. So you can't do reads, but you can do writes. It's OK for the deadlock, uh, the deadlock detection computation will run and will deterministically deadlock or deterministically complete. And whatever writes it does will be a deterministic uh, function of its execution. So it's OK for the deadlock detection scenario to allow the child to write to state owned by the parent. So these are sort of fun interactions that sit at the boundary of our different um, monads for control effects. OK. I want to switch gears and show you a little more on the application front. So Just, Simon? In terms of these, it seems to be quite a lot of combinations that, as a programmer, I might be a little bit daunted by. Yeah. Um, so kind of as a programmer, you want some sort of simple story that kind of always works. Is that, so it's maybe interesting for sort of from an implementation point of view. For the programming story, are you expecting to expose all of this to the programmer? Yeah, so all, all of these are basically uh, each is combinator with a, with a hairy type. So when you want to use one of these, you have to sort of select exactly that So you do have to be aware of these distinctions yeah. and, and use them. Yeah. And um, the, the only thing I'll say about that is that the types do grow quite hairy, but inference has done a good job so far. Yeah. Uh, and so we can have reasonable terms, but pretty ugly types. Uh, so for example, if you want to use this one, you call a combinator that gives you a little escape hatch. There's a lot of for all s's hanging out here. We're effectively doing region typing using the st trick. And so the parent region is a different region than the child region. And what you get is you get a little lift function that's passed to your child, uh, and it's your escape hatch. So if you want to modify things in the parent, you call the lift function to compute to sort of cast your right effect to the parent. So yes, this is quite manual compared to if you built these features directly into a language, I'm sure you could go quite a bit further in making it economic, ergonomic. But, but doesn't the type of the child uh, quite restrict which of these you can I mean, so if the child uses something, then it puts you in the right place and sure. only some of them work. Sure, yeah. If the child has a right in it, then its E parameter will be fixed so that it has right. It won't be polymorphic in that switch. And, and then if you try to use it under a cancelable, you'll get a type error. And then you have the choice of either doing something else or sh gear shifting down to non-determinism. Uh, but at least it lets you know that this combination of things you've tried to do is not deterministic. So if you want to do it, you have to own up to it and move it to the IO monad. Um, that's the idea. All right, so I want to tell you a little story about an application that I was implementing before this work uh, with my wife, who's a biologist. So this is an application for phylogenetics, and the, it does a few different things. It's called PhiBen. It's for exploring different phylogenetic trees, uh, because sometimes you end up with quite a few of these. Existing software will produce like a 1,000 different trees, which is hard to deal with. Uh, so what it does, the main thing it does is it creates a distance matrix telling you what the edit distance between all of the 1,000 trees you just got are. Uh, so this is just an example of an application that turns out to be monotonic. And uh, a little bit of an anecdote to support the claim that monotonic applications actually are hiding in the wild perhaps more than you might expect. So what does, that, does this application do? It computes tree edit distance between pairs of trees. Tree edit distance, uh, interesting fact, can be computed by treating every interior node in the tree as a bipartition of the leaf nodes, and then simply counting how many bipartitions are, differ between one tree and another. You have a set of bipartitions. I have a set of bipartitions. The set difference between those bipartitions is our tree edit distance. Uh, that's kind of fun. And so how do you compute the tree edit distance? Well, the hash RF algorithm is to take a set of trees, traverse over all the trees, and then for each tree, traverse all of its bipartitions. Uh, th that is, traverse all of its intermediate nodes, and then basically um, count up which tree IDs uh, exhibit which bipartitions. So um, uh, this is something I like to call attention to, because uh, not only do we have irregular data structures, like sets and maps, but we have unusual key and value types. So this is a, this is a map whose key type is a bipartition of, tree I of uh, IDs, and whose value type is a set of integers. So that's kind of interesting. And then, well, this is a two-phase algorithm. You have to have a barrier after the first phase. And you iterate over every bucket in the thing on the left. 
And you ask, OK, this bipartition was in tree 2 and also in tree 3. So there's no additional distance between tree 2 and 3. But there is additional distance between trees 1 and 2 and 1 and 3. So you do this little n squared operation, and you increment the distance matrix. So this distance matrix is built by plus 1 operations, one at a time, in parallel. So naturally, this is a kind of fetch and add operation. And this is a, a two-dimensional array of counter LVARs. Uh, so we've got a map LVAR on the left. We've got a counter LVAR on the right with non-idempotent bump operations. Uh, we've got a barrier in between the two because we need to use a freeze operation or a run par then freeze uh, to be able to exactly read the contents of the thing on the left and build up the thing on the right. So that's how this application works. That's how Phibin works. Um, it's quite fast compared to most of the things biologists were actually using for this, uh, DendroPy, Phylip. Um, and so we've got a few biologists that are, that are using it now. And I think I have some maintenance work to go do on it as we speak. Um, but that's uh, one example of monotonicity in the wild. Now, so far, we've been talking about these LVARs which accumulate information monotonically. But there's, there's also, uh, of course, scenarios where you want to do non-monotonic writes to different parts of the heap that are disjoint, and therefore the writes are not interfering. So DPJ, of course, and systems like it specialize in making this safe, whereas LVARs specialize in things like reductions, where you intentionally want interference between computations. But there's no reason that we can't combine both of these flavors. And in Elvish, we do. Um, we provide a separate mechanism that you can use to do disjoint writes to uh, different regions of the heap. So for example, if you want to do a parallel merge sort, well, what is the fastest possible that you could have written in Haskell before this work. Well, um, merge sort, of course, is a divide and conquer algorithm. And each time you do a recursion, you're getting subarrays back. If you write the entire algorithm out of place, this is going to be a pretty slow sort, contrary to some claims. Now, Haskell has long had the ability to move sub t when you bottom out to sequential. Typical parallel sort will always eventually bottom out to a sequential sort. And when you bottom out to a sequential sort, you can do it in place, just like you would do it in C or any imperative language. Uh, so that's great. But there's actually an ugly thing about this picture, which is that you still have some number of phases where you're doing it out of place. And those phases where you're doing it out of place are at the top of the tree, when the thing is biggest, and it's bigger than L2 cache size. So this creates a significant slowdown. The sequential version in place, but the parallel version out of place is not good enough. And um, you can see that in some So for a benchmark suite of LVAR applications, uh, all of which have no shared mutable state, so they're just using LVARs. Uh, the one that stood out as slow was sorting, because sorting couldn't make any good use of um, in-place update to state across threads. So it didn't have very good scaling on this 12-core machine. So how do we fix that? Well, what we want to do is we somehow want to create a parallel session that encompasses all of these parallel subroutine calls and makes it safe to, um, to sort different pieces of the same array. So I still want to do S, use ST, the ST monad, to do the heavy lifting in the end, uh, where I actually want to sort the sequential array. But I want to make it safe for those sequential array slices that I sort to be uh, physically located within a single global array that I started with. So I don't want to do copying operations. Uh, that's fine, but then avoid data races. And how do we avoid non-determinism? AKA, how do we ensure this region disjointness property that left is disjoint from the region on the right? So there's been quite a lot of work on program analyses and on type systems that enable you to determine this non-interference property. But here we actually use a much simpler strategy. So rather than anti the alias freedom of a program, we simply preserve the alias freedom. So we only give you tools that uh, preserve alias freedom when you're working with mutable state. So this is something like one of these boxes where you're not allowed to ever directly touch the mutable state yourself. You're always operating indir indirectly through some safe mechanism. And so that means that we need to define a grammar of safe actions that you can execute on mutable state. Sorry, can, can, you, can you explain? So the, the problem is, how do you embed these two ST guys mm -hmm. safely mm -hmm. in the, inside the PAR session? That's right. And uh, so, OK, so the, these, the, each of these ST guys, you can run them in isolation using all the kind of hierarchiness thing very easily. Right. Uh, so. I maybe yes. skipped a step a little bit. So. Yeah. If the, you've got this vector, you want to run an ST computation in the left half and the right half. Those are both pieces of the same object. So that's OK. We have slicing operations to do constant time slicing of an array in data.vector, for instance, uh -huh. in Haskell. Uh -huh. uh, but how do you know that those things don't alias? I see. So, so, so they are part of the same state thread. Yeah. 
Well, they're part of the same physical heap object. You never, you never have the same location accessible between two different ST communications. So, so, so my, my point was, is there, so it's a, it's a case where you could not play the higher rank run ST. Is that, is that what no, it's not good enough because you need some way to subdivide the array and right, recur on the left array. The same. Yeah, but the trick that we use is not that complicated. So basically what we say is you're in a state monad where your state is a, a mutable entity and there are no aliases to that mutable entity. So you are, it's sort of an iso, isolated reference. Uh, you've basically got the only copy of that. And then here are some things you can do to that mutable entity that are safe. You can create a new one. It's always safe to create an array. It doesn't al alias with anything. Uh, you can duplicate an array. Uh, that's always safe. It makes a copy of the memory, so it doesn't introduce aliasing. And you can also split the array. Uh, so split in the middle, split into even and odd elements. You can define whatever grammar of safe splits you want. The trusted library writer in this case defines what is safe and hands a set of safe combinators to the user. Okay, so, so split doesn't actually really physically split. It just allows you to have a split view. No, it's O1. Yeah. Well, well, okay, at least if you're splitting it to left and right. If you split it even and odd elements, uh, it's a little messy. But, um, but yeah, for a typical split where you split at a position, it's just doing an O1 operation to create a new point of the left half, point of the right half. And the way we do arrays, it's, they're always bounds checked. So you can't use your point of the left half to sneak over and access the right half because of bounds checking. All right, so that's basically it uh, for these safe grammar of alias freedom preserving actions. Uh, the, the only wrinkle here is you do need to be able to handle, for example, tuples of arrays. We need two arrays to do merge sort. Um, so this could get, if you had a lot of different mutable data types in your algorithm, this could get very clunky because you need to sort of treat it as one mutable object and issue these commands against it like duplicate and split. But what we find is that if you already can offload most of your state to either immutable state, which can be read anywhere, or monotonic state, which can be read by LVARs, so your reductions or whatnot could happen in LVARs, the state that you actually need to update destructively is often very simple for an algorithm. There's often only one data structure that needs to be updated uh, destructively. So that's why it, uh, I think it's fairly ergonomic to use this kind of state monad approach. And that's what we use to fix our performance to bend our curve back up for a parallel merge sort. And here's our parallel merge sort compared against the same algorithm implemented in Silk and then also implemented in deterministic parallel Java. Um, so we do okay there. All right. Any questions on that before I do the last leg here? Oh, sorry. These are all normalized against Silk. So. Um, it's just headed speed up, but I see the actual, the actual, the constant factors are here too. They start lower than Silk, yes. Yeah. Okay. So Silk starts at one. Everybody else starts at some fraction of Silk. <coughs> yeah. So worse than Silk, better than DPJ. This is the short story. And this is on a normal hotspot JVM. Uh, DPJ doesn't have any runtime overhead. It's just a type system. Um, OK, last segment, unless there are any other questions. This is the implementation bit where we get a little beneath the hood. Um, so there are two implementation techniques I want to briefly tell you about before we wrap up. Uh, one of them is about these concurrent data structures themselves. So I mentioned using lock-free data structures. Now, there's a reason that we haven't simply replaced all of our sequential data structures. Even though .NET and the JVM have great libraries of concurrent data structures, we didn't simply throw out all the other ones, and that's because there are some disadvantages to concurrent data structures. I think of them something like this. They, they are sort of slow to get going. They're often more expensive to allocate. If you have a lot of small data structures, you typically don't want lock-free concurrent data structures. But once you really get going, once you have a lot of contented access and a big data structure, then you're going to win with a lock-free data structure. Uh, so uh, here's just a little evidence to support that. So for example, concurrent skip list map inside the JVM, uh, it's slower to allocate than, um, than a pure data structure. Uh, there's a, a nice library of pure data structures for Java as well. Um, everything I'm showing you in this series of slides is implemented in Haskell and Java, just for an extra point of comparison. Uh, so a pure data structure in the context of something like LVARs is, really means that you have a, only a single mutable location. Because an LVAR is still mutable, but you can always use this age-old trick of having a single reference, mutable reference, pointing to a pure data structure, which is quite a handy thing to have. You can operate on the entire data structure atomically. It has a number of great advantages. But it necessarily is unscalable because there's only a single mutable memory location that different threads are going to have to contend over. 
So this is the data structure that I want if you've just allocated it, if it's uncontended, if you want to take a snapshot of it. There are many reasons I want this data structure on the left. But there are also many reasons that I want one of these full-sized, um, fully featured, um, concurrent skip, uh, skip list type data structures on the, on the right. And how do we know which one to pick? Well, one option is certainly to pass the decision on to the user. We can implement uh, data.lvar.skiplist and data.lvar.puremap, uh, and we do. Um, but that is a little bit unsatisfactory because we'd love to just expose a single default map data structure that does the right thing in most scenarios. Uh, and furthermore, sometimes you can't statically decide because you have code locations. You might have, for example, a nested collection of collections, some of which are hotly accessed, some of which are cold, in which case there is no static decision as to which of these two data structures you should use. So the simple thing that we've been exploring is um, how do you take this A and B data structure and adapt between them dynamically? Uh, so this was the topic of our ICFP, one of our ICFP papers last year. Uh, we designed an algorithm for detecting contention and transitioning from an A state to a transitional state, gradually copying over in the background the old data structure to the new one, and then eventually committing the transition from the uh, A, B state to the B state and garbage collecting uh, everything on the left. Uh, so the result is a data structure that performs mostly like the A data structure on the single-threaded use case or uncontended use case, and mostly like the concurrent data structure on the multi-threaded contended use case. Uh, we also proved some guarantees about this. The resulting hybrid algorithm, in spite of doing these internal transformations, retains lock freedom. And uh, it's important for that proof that the starting data structure actually be a pure immutable data structure. Uh, likewise, we prove linearizability and correct set semantics. Uh, for, the, for the hybrid data structure, assuming those things already hold of the underlying A and B data structures. Uh, so we compare um, the hybrid versus the non-hybrid in both Java and in Haskell. And the upshot is basically that the hybrid data structure can be twice as fast as the concurrent one uh, when you're on one thread, but it can be way faster than the non-concurrent one when you go to 16 threads. Do you... Do you guarantee that if it's contended, it will eventually get to be the, the B case? Or is it just that you will keep backing out if you fail? Yeah, that's, that's actually interesting. So um, the way we formalize it, we guarantee that some method will complete in bounded time. And we actually have to guarantee that it will, uh, it will transition. Because we formulate transition as one of our, uh, our methods that has to complete within bounded time. So if the scheduler chose only to uh, execute the transition method, that would be the only method that would complete. Um, so, so the short answer is yes. Why is it any faster on one thread? Ah, yes. Um, it's only one thread. There's no contention. Uh, sorry. Um, the hybrid is twice as fast as the concurrent data structure on one thread because it stays in the A state. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. um, it never goes to the B state if it's one thread. Yeah. The hybrid is faster than the... Yes. The non-scalable data structure does terribly if you're hammering it from 16 threads. I see. So the hybrid is, I, I see, is, is better than the bad case on one thread, and it's better than the bad case on exactly. many threads. It's a, the bad case is a different use case. Exactly. It's a compromise. Yeah. Um, all right. Oof. Gosh. I could switch another slide deck with that, but I don't have the I don't have the slide for that right now. Um, it's on the order of ten or twenty percent, I think. Uh, all right. Uh, second implementation technique, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, once you've run one of these parallel sessions, you get back a regular immutable data structure. You get back a frozen LVAR. And when we want to take this to use it in a distributed programming context, it's important to send these data structures over the network. But as I said, we're focusing on irregular data structures like sets and maps. So they tend to consist of many heap objects, a graph of heap objects, rather than just a big unboxed array, for example. Um, so what we would really like to do is arrange it so that all those heap objects can be allocated together in one region of the heap so that we can send them over the network together. Uh, and this is our other ICFP paper from last year where we worked on something we call compact normal forms, which are a form of uh, region-based uh, allocation. And uh, basically, we the fact that the Glasgow Haskell compiler is already using a block-structured heap. So it's pretty easy for us to construct a new kind of heap block that models one of these compact 
regions. And furthermore, we leverage immutability because we know that if we pack all of these red objects into that compact region, and we know that the transitive closure of all pointers will stay in that compact region, that invariant will never be broken in the future because there's no mutation that will come along and point to outside of the region. Uh, so we leverage those uh, advantages in this scenario to uh, expose a very simple programmer API for working with compact regions. Um, so there's Fancy region types exposed in the type system. This is just purely a, a runtime technique. Uh, so the nice thing about this is it lets you send these data structures over the network much more quickly than if you have to serialize and deserialize them. And that's actually a little bit surprising because it's in spite of the fact that you use many more bytes. You use uh, up to twice, two to four times as many bytes that you're actually sending over the network. But the network is very fast, such as uh, we ran it on a quad band, uh, InfiniBand uh, network. Um, then it still comes out much faster to skip the serialization and send the in-heap representation directly over the network. Likewise, if you're loading large data sets from disk, for example, a month of Twitter data was one benchmark we did in this paper, uh, this is going to take several gigabytes. Loading it from disk would be 21x faster compared to the best serialization libraries we have available. This was binary, I believe. Um, it's 21x faster to just mmap the compact normal form than it is to deserialize from disk. So what we do is we build a transparent caching layer where for, for any file on disk that you parse, you can just transparently cache it on some temp file system uh, in this internal representation and then mmap that in. Especially if you're doing random access into the middle of this Twitter data set rather than consuming the whole thing, then uh, it can be 100x faster for, for random access than a serialization approach. All right, that's the last. Show you the wrap slide here. I wanted to mention that the main thrust that I'm the main thrust of this argument is that determinism should be a safety property and should be treated like type safety. And in fact, in the context of these Haskell libraries, it is a matter of type safety. Um, so there are different ways that we can ensure this safety property. We can ensure it by construction, as we've done with our basic design of threading and synchronization and barriers. Uh, likewise, with our accommodators for retaining alias freedom for um, for our ST mutable state between threads. So we can ensure this property by construction. In some cases, we can trust, uh, but we don't want to trust the end user. We can still try to minimize the trusted code base for our library writer. Uh, we've got this very important distinction between different parties here, because we want to be able to run untrusted code, potentially, that we've gotten over the network, and know that the type that our type checker assigns it, and the determinism level therein, uh, will hold. Um, so right now, we're trusting quite a lot because we're trusting our LVAR implementations. And there's sort of no bound to how many of these you need because you need to port as many data structures as you need. Unfortunately, it's a rather long-term project to get any full verification of those concurrent data structures, especially against weak memory models. So that's smart people are working on that, and it's, a, it's an ongoing effort. Eventually, maybe we'll get a verified C try or verified concurrent skip list in there. Finally, there are a couple little tidbits which uh, I haven't emphasized in this presentation, which are actually holes in our argument. So there are ways that you can take our existing Elvish library and get it to behave non-deterministically, because there are little tiny bits of the user's code that we unfortunately trust. Uh, and these are things like associativity, the associativity of operators that you use in a reduction. Or uh, a critical one is when we're doing all of those inserts to shared sets, the key types that you use for inserting into a shared uh, map or set um, they need to have a total or, uh, ordering function. They need to have a true total order. And likewise, their equality needs to be commutative. If you have a broken EQ or ORD instance, and this is a Haskell-specific type class, uh, then you can leak non-determinism. Because even though the application should be deterministic, it depends on these commuting inserts. And the specific set of comparisons on keys from run to run is going to be non-deterministic. So right now, that's a hole. And we're trying to, um, to work on patching it. We've currently got a project to um, use the proof extensions of Liquid Haskell to try to prove these properties and basically um, squeeze out our last little bit of trusted code from the user. So that at all. All right, so that's it for today, and I'm happy to take any further questions that you have. Go straight down to uh, raw, relaxed memory code. Some of these algorithms look beautifully weight free in the abstract code, turn out to be rather deleterious in, in uh, relaxed memory. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, we do. Um, and we mostly trust other people to get the algorithms right for particular data structures. Um, for ha for high-level Haskell code, we've got another project that's looking at making sequential consistency the memory model for Haskell. But that's for I/O computation, and really everything here we've talked about is outside of the I/O monad. So we want to have a we want the memory model to not appear, to not be visible in this. Uh, but yes, our implementations do have to deal with relaxed memory. Uh, so that would be down inside the implementations of all these data structures mainly. Um, yeah. Now, interestingly, I, I find that um, you know most concurrent log free data structures they they really don't ever use writes. They only use compare and swaps and reads. Um, so in some sense, especially on uh, x86 TSO, which is what we've been targeting so far, uh, the scenario is somewhat simpler. We have algorithms with no writes. Um, yeah, and compare and swap has a fence, of course. So. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot.